Thank you very much for joining us. We are the partners that are leading on this project. The Celtic um, rainforests in Wales. We're we're running the project, and we are funded through a fund called Life, and we are trying to conserve and look after the rainforests. We are concentrating on five different areas, specifically special ancient woodlands, which are the best sites as far as the rainforests are concerned. We have three main elements. One is to look after, well, look after the forests by getting rid of the rhododendron porticum and grazing in those woodlands and forests. And the third element is what we're going to be talking about today, which is to renovate the ancient woodlands which have been planted with conifers, etc. And I, like I said, the National Park are leading on the project and there are other main partners, RSPP, Cymru and Cadw. Adam is presenting today. He works for Coed Cadw Woodland Trust and he's leading on this element of. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce Adam with it to start with his presentation. Thanks, Adam. Yochaval um, Anita, thanks for having me. Um, I'm just going to start sharing my screen. Um, and go and click the presentation. Okay, so we've got a lot to get through. Um, hopefully, you can see, we'll see that. Um, so I'm going to just uh, start right away. Um, so, yeah, Anita just uh, set the context for the Celtic Rainforest Project. Just um, wanted to show you this map uh, globally, showing the, the extent of the temperate rainforest um, on Earth, um, and it's 1% of the Earth's land mass. Um, so it's uh, actually a habitat that's rarer than the tropical rainforest, which is about 6%. Um, and it's typified by over 1,500 millimetres rainfall annually, um, hence the name rainforest. And you can see up there the western seaboard of um, mainland British Isles uh, has got extensive uh, temperate rainforest. Um, yeah, as Anita said, this is a partnership project between Snowdonia National Park Authority, RSPB, and Coed Caddy, the Woodland Trust. There's a big focus on invasive non-native species control, so in from Ponticum mainly, but there's also an action for ancient woodland restoration, which is um, my role in the project. Um, so just moving on to the next. So I'm going to cover three main things today. I'm going to talk about what is ancient woodland in the context of really Snowdonia. I'm going to look at the first aid um, for ancient woodland, so the first phase of ancient woodland restoration. And then I'm going to look at longer term forest management, so a second phase that we might move into. OK, so ancient woodland in Ariri. Well, I'm mainly focusing in this project on the Merionid Oakwoods um, and Bat sites, which is a, a designated area, which is it's a special area of conservation in the Tura 2000 site. Um, it's 2,812 hectares. You can see there the pink polygons, the pink shapes on the map. Um, within the Snowdonia National Park area. Um, and 93.9% .9 of this is ASNW, which is ancient semi-natural woodland. Um, and you can see down here um, in the bottom left of the screen, there's a picture of what you might think of as a typical ancient woodland. Lots of uh, mosses covering boulders and trees um, and lots of ferns and lichens. Um, but the important thing with this is that we're not just working within the SAC the, the SAC, we we're also working within um, a 100 metre buffer zone of the special area of conservation. Um, and that is because of the fact of adjacency. So often within this 100 metre buffer zone, we find um, conifer plantations on ancient woodland sites. And the project has money to spend to, uh, to manage those conifers appropriately. Um, and also just to mention that the, the actual uh, SAC itself, the special area of conservation, I will refer to it as the SAC, that's okay, um, has an unfavourable condition at the moment. Uh, that was after 
um, a number of surveys being carried out across the um, across the special area of conservation. Um, so this project is really timely and important in order to, to turn that into a favourable condition over time. Um, I'm just going to set some definitions first, looking at what ancient woodland is. So one of the really important resources we can use um, to find out whether a site is ancient or not, um, ancient woodland, is the ancient woodland inventory. So ancient woodland in Wales is 94,941 hectares. This is, the, this is 45 percent of the land cover, which is, in, which is higher than the average for the UK. 25% uh, of this ancient woodland is in the public forest estate, so managed by NRW. We're working with NRW's partners in the project uh, to help um, the management of um, boars sites within, within the uh, national park. So this is what we're really, really concerned about, is the boars area. So these are plantations on ancient woodland sites, and we go into a bit more detail about what that actually means. These are the figures for Wales, you can see. So 27% of the ancient woodland in Wales are, um, are planted with um, non-native conifers or non-native broadleaf species. Okay. So plantations on ancient woodland sites. I'm going to probably talk, talk in a lot of acronyms. Uh, one of those is PAWS, P-A-W-S, so P-A-W-S. But by the time we finish this, you should probably understand a fair few of these really well. Um, so what are PAWS? OK, well, you can see some images here. Um, they are plantations uh, which have been established on ancient woodland sites. And this happened a lot in the 20th century. And at the time, it was thought to be the right thing to do. Um, so we can't fault people in a way for making that decision at the time. Um, and it was, it was influenced a lot by the, the two world wars and the need for a timber supply. Um, so after the Second World War, we found that a lot of our ancient woodlands, which um, in Wales, a lot of them were oak canopy woodlands, um, you know, had been clear felled uh, for the war effort. Um, and uh, after that time, there was an establishment of, uh, of fast growing softwood crops, conifers on these sites in order to create, um, you know, a, a strategic reserve of timber. That was the kind of underlying principle of why the Forestry Commission was set up in the first place. Um, so these are uh, sites which have um, really a single species often. Uh, they've got a very simple structure and they've got um, a lack of complexity. So I'm going to talk about what complexity means in a, in a forestry context in a bit. Um, but they don't have to be conifers. Uh, down in the bottom right, you can see a stand of ash there, which are all very, very dense. There's been no management. There's been no thinning at all over time. And these have developed very straight, tall trees with very little crown structure. So the crown is where the, um, the branches uh, divide away from the main stem. Um, so beech and red oak are often found as plantation speech, species on, on, on pause sites, as well as a whole list of um, conifers. Um, they often have ancient wooden features which we can identify, and I'm going to go into what those mean. Um, and they have a, a dense structure and a closed canopy, and they're often on difficult terrain, and the crop, so the plantation crop, is often reaching maturity. So they're quite complex sites as to, what, to, as to know what to do with them. Um, but I'm going to go on to some different ideas about how we can manage these four sites. Um, so just um, another context uh, setting um, thing is to talk about sustainable forestry. So what do the standards say about plantations on ancient woodland sites? Well, there's two standards we can go to in UK forestry. The first one is UKFS on the right hand side here, the UK Forestry Standard. There's a whole load of different um, uh, guidelines and uh, recommendations um, which could relate to ancient woodland, but I've just picked out these from the biodiversity guidelines, uh, specifically by um, guideline 35 on plantations on ancient woodland sites, ensure that features of ancient woodland remnants are protected and consider progressive restoration to, nat to native woodland. So this is um, the UK forestry standard and it's got some great ideas in, but also it mentions words like consider and think about rather than setting kind of hard and fast um, rules. Uh, so it's good in, in many ways, but I, I hope after this you will understand why maybe we should be thinking about going a bit further. Um, and going further is uh, the UK Woodland Assurance Standard. So this, is, this underpins uh, certification of um, sustainable forestry in the UK. So FSC certification, for example, and UPWAS um, has its own um, uh, 
own guidelines on specifically plantations on ancient woodland. Um, so it's the idea that the owner or manager should enhance or restore features in areas of high conservation value within plantations on ancient woodland sites. So to identify, evaluate, and ad adopt a precautionary approach. Okay, so these are really useful um, standards, which I think are very important when thinking about manage managing these sites and really worth having a look at. Okay, so um, now I'm going to look into first aid for ancient woodlands. So how would we how would we establish the best way of managing these sites? So a lot of the, the ideas I'm drawing from um, right now are taken from the Woodland Trust's um, modules on ancient woodland restoration. There's five of these. So um, these are available on the Woodland Trust website and um, they establish a series of phases um, which can be followed um, for the restoration of these sites. So the most important um, first step is that these um, sites are surveyed and that the features are mapped. And that's something that um, we've been carrying out as part of the Celtic Rainforest Project. So if there are any um, landowners out there who have or think they have ancient woodlands, specifically forest sites, then please get in touch with us because we can, we can help. Um, so surveying and mapping, these are, these are really important um, baseline activities which were mentioned within those two standards I, I, I spoke about just earlier. Um, in, through the survey, we can establish the condition, and that's really important to, to work out where the ancient woodland features might be and to establish what condition they're in. Um, and the Woodland Trust uses three main categories um, for, to establish condition, secure, threatened, and critical. And you can see on this map here, the green is secure, the red area is critical and the orange area is threatened. And it's quite a basic system, but it really does help to channel your thoughts and to organize your objectives. Um, so some of the things that might be, uh, might influence the condition, uh, the fact that there's a dense plantation canopy, uh, there's a lot of shade, shading out the understory, that the, 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 um, the plantation stand has a very simple structure, it's an even age, there, there are no, there's no difference in terms of um, the age class of the trees, and um, there's probably a lack of regeneration. There's, there could be a seeding of um, shade tolerant conifers in the understory or, or shade tolerant broadleaf species such as beech. And there could be invasive non-native species such as rhododendron consequent, Japanese knotweed, Himalayan balsam. It's important to prioritize work. So um, we use a category of one to five, one being uh, this, this is work that needs to happen immediately uh, and five being this is something that can happen in the long term that needs to be built into a management plan and it's important that these these priority one works in critical areas are carried out um, as soon as possible in order to prevent um, dieback or loss of ancient wooden features so what are these features i keep on mentioning so i'm going to go to another slide here showing ancient wooden features so um Breaking it down into four categories just helps, um, or five categories, sorry, it helps to think about um, uh, what we've got when we, when we look at a, a plantation on ancient woodland sites. So one of the really important uh, features are relic and pre-plantation native trees and shrubs. So I also call them remnant broadleaves, and you can see at the top right there's a picture of a, a small leaf lime tree um, in a stand of Douglas fir. So these are important um, bridges back to the previous ecological um, condition of the site. So sometimes uh, a, an ancient woodland was, um, it, its broadleaf canopy was removed, apart from some trees were left. Maybe they were really difficult to get access to. Maybe they were on really steep slopes. Um, and those trees are often um, in a really bad condition. Uh, this is this line here is actually doing pretty well. This site uh, near Dugatli has actually received some really um, good uh, restoration management actions and um, a lot of the mature trees on site are, are looking okay but um, some that we come to and I'm going to go into this a bit later on uh, their crowns are really uh, suffering dieback and they're on their last legs and sometimes they're, they're actually just standing deadwood um, but these are really important because if we can manage these right we can bring them back we can bring their crowns back to life and they might be able to start seeding into the understory of the ancient woodland um, also important are Woodland specialist plants. So plants that we only find in ancient woodland because of their particular characteristics. They don't produce a lot of seed. 
they don't produce uh, wind dispersed seed, they might produce heavy seed that rely on other vectors for um, dispersal. So you can see down in the bottom right hand corner, we've got a stand of wooden anemone here. And these are plants you, just, you don't find outside of ancient woodland. Um, so it's important to understand where these hotspots of um, flora are and to map those and to think about them when we're moving around the site on foot, but also with machinery and where also where we're felling trees and where we're, where we're building up brash. So we really want to know, oh, there's a really important stand there of a particular um, species. Maybe this wood anemone only appears in one part of the site. Um, so we really don't want to like, put our brash mats right over that. Um, also important is uh, decaying wood, or coarse woody debris. And this is something that's lacking in our, in our woodlands across the UK. Um, and often there's a tendency to gather uh, dead wood or fallen wood for firewood, which is a really um, you know, an important need for people to, to fuel themselves. But I think we need to realise that um, there should be a certain volume of dead wood on the floor of an ancient woodland and indeed any woodland. Um, it has a number of different important um, positive uh, impacts on the ecological processes of the site. So it actually does help to drive um, an increase in productivity, an increase in regeneration an increase in timber increments. It's not just an ecological function. Um, also uh, really important are forest soils. Um, and I've got a slide here which shows um, a whole load of different microorganisms, fungal, hyphae, insect eggs, and the soil in, a, in an ancient woodland has not been disturbed in the same way as say a pasture might have been if it's been improved. Um, the soil is built up and layered over centuries of, of leaf litter falling. Um, and it contains fungal diversity unlike that of um, any other woodland. So it's really important that the soils are looked after and also we really don't want to compact these soils too much and to increase uh, rainwater runoff and increase silt build up in our, in our uh, river catchments. So, so understanding that the soils are actually a feature of ancient woodland as well is really important when, uh, when we're thinking about management. And then the lastly, uh, also important is archaeological and cultural remains. And I've got, there's a LIDAR picture here where you can see a topography uh, brought out by the LIDAR scanning image. Um, you can see that there's a boundary, like an ancient wood bank all the way around this site, which shows the old boundary, which you can't see if you look at the canopy layer. Um, so these are really important features. Often in um, Melionid, uh, we find charcoal hearts uh, because of the importance of charcoal for, for the production of iron. Um, but we also find saw pits and things like that. And these show that, um, you know, the history of these sites, they show that ancient woodlands were really important to local economies of the past. Um, and that they were very um, important culturally as sites that contributed to um, Welsh language and culture. Um, and we need to retain those links just as much as we need to retain the ecologies of the sites. So um, I'm just going to talk about phase one actions. So. Um, once you've established the condition and you've looked at um, the priorities of work, what are these actions that you can carry out? As I said before, it's really important to establish um, clear objectives. Um, that can be done through carrying out a survey, creating a management plan, mapping your features, creating an inventory uh, so we understand timber volume, but we also understand the different volumes of different species across the site and then applying for a felling license if we're going to do any significant work. Um, yeah, it's really good, I think, on poor sites for reasons I've explained to avoid clear felling. Uh, we want to try and retain woodland conditions as much as possible, um, but sometimes there's no other way. For example, if a site supports mature hemlock, uh, it's very, very difficult to think about how we might um, thin the site without producing a large amount of hemlock uh, regeneration. And often, as I said, these sites are on really steep slopes. It might be a, a one-off opportunity to get the machines there. Um, maybe it's worth, unfortunately, clear felling and then starting again through broadleaf restocking. Um, one of the most important phase one activities is targeted felling. This is um, halo thinning, or another word for this could be phased release. I'm gonna talk about that in more detail in a second, um, but also, creating a, a management plan for the invasive non-natives such as rhododendron, um, but also other invasives um, are um, hemlock regeneration and beech regeneration. And they can just, they can clog up the understory and shade out um, ancient woodland specialist floral hotspots and prevent the regeneration of site native species. So um, there needs to be a plan for the management of, um, of regeneration and 
invasive on natives. Um, just a little mention about uh, the inventory. Um, forest, forestry really progresses in a, in, a, in a positive direction, I think, through the gathering of data. Um, and it's important to gather data over time. It's important to get into a regular cycle of gathering data. Um, and one of the most important things is the, is the diameter at breast height of the trees. Um, from that um, measurement, or, or also just from a measurement using an instrument called a reliscope, we can build up an idea of the basal area. So that is the um, cross-sectional area of, 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 a, of a timber of a particular tree within a, within a one hectare area. So basal area is a really important uh, measurement um, and we can measure the basal area before any management has been done. We can measure it after thinning has been carried out. We can measure it three, five, ten years after the thinning has been carried out and we can see how the, um, the timber increment has changed, the timber volume has changed within a hectare. So this is just a, a table that's really useful. You can see um, this is target basal area in order to produce uh, natural regeneration. Um, and this is taken from the Pro Silver Silver Culture Guide, which is available on the prosilverisland.com website. It's a really, really useful guide. It's been translated from, from Belgium, uh, from, from French, uh, but it's from Belgium. Um, so yeah, you can see how there's a difference between light demanding species and shade tolerant species. Often conifers, so often the plantation conifers are actually much more shade to tolerant than the, than the broadleaves, which we're trying to, um, to increase. Uh, so we have to get a real balance here between reducing the basal area of conifers enough to try and um, create some advanced regeneration of broadleaf species, but we don't want to open things up too much. We don't want to reduce the basal area such that um, we start to get a huge uh, growth of coarse um, vegetation. So basal area is something that can be reduced gradually over time. And I think the gradual process is a, is a really important approach when it comes to re restoration of ancient woodlands. It's a, it's a gradual process of carrying out an action, seeing what happens, carrying on with the good stuff, maybe stopping the negative stuff. So that idea of adaptive forest management, which is so important. Okay, moving on from inventory to targeted felling. So as I said, this is, uh, could also be called the phased release of suppressed broadleaves. Um, at the top right here, you can see uh, this, is, um, this is a site on the Malbach estuary uh, where you've got um, oak that are very um, suppressed by beech. So beech is, is hugely prevalent on this site. And you can see, although it's, it's not a great image in winter because we haven't got the, the leaf uh, burst, we haven't got the canopy there, but you can see either side of this oak in the middle are beech trees and behind it there's a holly, um, but the oak crown is really suffering um, and there's another one here so quite soon we're going to lose these oak um, and that's the last kind of connection to this sort of genetic uh, makeup of the of the previous canopy I think it's probably too late for these oak um, to be released but in other situations um, you, the, the release can happen and it can really um, produce a positive uh, response um, phased release because we don't want to open up too quickly too soon we don't want to shock these trees that might have spent the last 70 80 100 years um, surrounded by the, the, the growth of conifer uh, species around them you can see the image in the left hand corner there it's just got this tiny amount of um, leaf uh, cover growing on the very very top of the tree but after removing a few few um, conifer uh, stems in front of this tree we started to open up um, and there's another example here of an ash, uh, which was surrounded by Norway spruce and Western hemlock, um, has, been, has been released through halo thinning. So the, the, the importance of halo thinning is, is that it's, it needs to be carried out by um, a, a really um, experienced chainsaw operator, um, because it's really important to carry out um, accurate directional felling, so we can fell away from the crown of the, of the broadleaf that we're trying to look after. Um, and um, we're not going to damage that. The crown has already been severely damaged by being suppressed. Uh, what we want to do is try to increase the growth of, 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 of the leaf um, canopy and have a subsequent um, growth of, of, um, of the root structure of the tree. We want to um, enable these mature trees to get back to a situation where they're healthy enough to start seeding again. And that will create a pulse of regeneration throughout the site as we start to open it up to the light. And a species that's really good for that is birch, obviously because it's a pioneer species, it produces a huge amount of seed. 
So if we can, if we've got birch on site, um, I think it's really important to start managing managing them carefully so that we can try to increase the strength of the crown of these of these trees and hopefully create regeneration, which can um, start filling the gaps where we open up gaps in the canopy. Um, but it's important to bear in mind that some of these um, mature broadleaves might be supporting epiphytic uh, plants, so plants that grow in trees. So we might have lichens, mosses, or ferns, uh, some of which might be quite rare, especially within the Meliodin sac, um, especially within other designated sites and triple SIs. Um, so if we open up too quickly, we might really change the moisture regime, the humidity of the site. So that's another reason why we call this phased release. It should be done in a gradual way in order to not shock the tree and its associated um, ecologies. Um, doing this targeted felling before doing anything else um, is an opportunity to increase the space around the crown of these important trees um, and to increase their wind firmness before any second phase work gets carried out. But sometimes it's just impossible to do um, any directional felling. Maybe the, the matrix of conifers around these trees is just so dense um, and the first thing maybe to do would be to carry out some ring barking um, and that can be done uh, mechanically with a chainsaw or it could be done through stem injection. Um, I think that has to be a, a decision that's made that bringing to, uh, to bear on it the, um, the, the importance of the site in terms of whether it's a triple SI or, or a SAC. And I would support the, um, the use of a chainsaw for ring barking. It's quite a quick and easy way of doing it and it, can, it would kill trees surrounding the, um, the mature broadleaf. Um, so that it, it manages to kind of get some space up there in the canopy. Um, so that's really important, that process of targeted felling. Okay, so that's established some phase one actions in the management of core sites. Um, just going to look a little bit now on um, the longer term forest management. So this could be considered a second phase of restoration. So maybe um, the first phase will be carried out and then we wait for a few years. Um, in order for the, um, the impacts of that initial work to, to really bed in. Um, so imagine that you've got a site with um, a scattering of mature oak and ash, and we've carried out some phased release of those mature trees. Um, it's saved the crowns, it's prevented that dieback of, of, the, of the trees. And three years, five years later, we're going to look at establishing a thinning regime across the matrix, across the, um, the wider, spread of uh, the conifer plantation or broadleaf plantation. Um, so this is where we're going to actually re remove a bigger amount of volume, a larger amount of volume from, from the site. Um, so trying to establish a thinning regime. Um, so that again, is really important to have that data, to have that volume information, to have the information about basal area so that you can establish what the thinning intensity might be, um, what's the appropriate thinning intensity so that the, you can you can carry out work in a sustainable way. I'm going to go into detail into thinning, um, extraction, and ecological processes in a bit. So we want to make sure that the site has got suitable infrastructure. Um, in order to carry out sustainable management of core sites, we do need to have tracks, we do need to have rides um, that are established and are um, established for perpetuity so that we, we only drive on certain areas of the site. Um, we want to make sure we're using appropriate machinery. But the machinery is not too large for the site. Um, it's not too large for the already established um, tracks and rides. And we're trying to work with ecological processes. So we're trying to work with what's there. We're trying to um, establish where the ancient wooden features are and uh, to, to, to safeguard those features, but also to strengthen and enhance them. I mean, these are words that are used in the sustainable guidelines I mentioned at the start. So, you know, we want to protect floral hotspots. You know, I said earlier about covering these with brush mats being a bad idea. We want to know where they are. These should be on your constraints maps. They should be, um, they should be there in your rams. You know, you should have an idea of where the floral hotspots are and they should not be driven over really. They should be, they should be protected. And over time, we should see these starting to strengthen and spread. So things that are important to see in the um, oceanic uh, woodlands of, of this part of Wales are stands of bilberry, stands of heather. You know, these are two species which are really important um, for the Atlantic oak woodlands. Um, and other things such as um, hard fern, and then a whole host of different uh, mosses, which are really, really um, uh, important. 
So um, we want to see some regeneration. That's what we're hoping to see after opening up the canopy, allowing some light into the forest floor, increasing the, the, um, the, the heat to the, to the forest floor, which for, for such a long time has been shaded um, and the gradual breakdown of, uh, of needle litter has been very, very slow. Once we start to let the sun in and the, and the air to move around, we're hoping that the um, often really thick mats of conifer needle litter start to break down and we start to see um, the regeneration of, um, of, of ground floor, but also tree regeneration. And so we, we will get, we'll get desirable species, which we're hoping for, and we'll get undesirable species, so things we don't, really don't want to see, but um, a management decision has to be made about what to do with those. Um, and uh, it can be important to go in and tend uh, uh, compartments, so to remove the, um, uh, conifer regeneration, which might be happening readily because you've um, increased the light level so much. And we want to see an increment of timber, we want to see an increment of volume in the trees we're trying to look after. Um, and also we need to see um, some sort of browsing management. It's not so important in this part of Wales, um, but in other parts of, of Wales and, and the rest of the UK, um, it's so important to be involved in, in managing, especially deer, um, because they are going to nibble that really important re regeneration that we want to see. Okay, so looking at a thinning regime, um, is it a crown thin or a low thin? Um, are, you are you going to remove a lot of the large dominant trees or are you coming in to remove um, a lot of the smaller suppressed trees? And I, I think with this, um, with, with approaching um, pause restoration, we want to do it what's called an intermediate thin, where it's a bit of a mixture of the two. Um, those really important dominant trees are the stand stabilizers. Uh, we, want to, we want to keep those in because they're going to prevent large catastrophic wind blow happening. Um, but also we want, to, we want to remove some of the smaller suppressed trees in order to open up the understory and to get some regeneration of native broadleaves in. Again, inventory is the key. So here we need to know what the volume is on the site of the particular uh, plantation species. And then we can work out the thinning intensity. Um, and that's something that the Woodland Trust can help it help with, um, we can help with through the Celtic Rainforest Project. Um, so we need to work out whether it's going to be a systematic thin or lower down the line we've got a selective thin. So systematic thin we'll be putting in uh, line thins every say every six racks um, or eight racks. Um, this, this can happen in, in a stand which has had um, little management um, to date, uh, and this is just to really open, open the stand up and allow um, these ecological processes to start again. Um, so in a situation of first thinning or early transformation, and when I say transformation, I'm talking about the transformation of the, of the stand to an irregular structure. Um, so we're trying to add complexity to the site. We're trying to break away from this even age um, structure that we often have on all sites. We're trying to create regeneration, which will create a different, um, a gradient of different age classes of trees. So we'll have natural regeneration, we'll have whole stage trees, we'll have trees just entering into maturity and then we'll have large, large diameter trees. We might have veteran trees, we might be lucky enough to have ancient trees as well. So um, a, a really important um, diversity of age classes will be um, created over time through regular thinning. Um, graduated density is uh, where you remove some of the volume from next to the rack that you've taken out as the line in order to open up a little bit more and that can, um, that can be really important in order to create uh, wind stability wind, and reduce the wind throw risk. Um, but a bit of wind throw is not something to, to um, worry about too much, I think it can be a useful indicator of where you've maybe thinned a little bit too heavily and where you need to um, just a step back a little bit. Um, what, one of the really important uh, factors in this is looking at the height to diameter ratio. And this is gonna be a really good, really good way of calculating the stability of the tree. So um, obviously the higher the height to diameter ratio, the, 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 the less stable the tree is. And um, there's, there's a kind of threshold about 80 to 100, depending on the site and the species um, of, of the height to, height to diameter. So like, Sites that haven't been uh, managed, often these sites have been neglected and haven't been ha had a regular thinning regime from uh, an early age. Um, we're coming to them late in the, in the life of the standard trees. It can be very different, difficult to know how to 
how to carry out that first inning. Um, and it's something that has to be done um, very slowly and gradually to see uh, whether um, you're, you're removing the, the right amount of volume or whether you've moved too, removed too much. And I think it's something to really kind of think about and, and, um, and work on slowly. But there are other decision support systems which we can use, such as Forest Chaos, produced by Forest Research, which is very, very useful for calculating the, uh, the impact that the wind might have on a particular um, operation on a site. So as we move into um, later in the, the life of this uh, process, we might be looking at selective thinning, where we're removing um, particular trees from around the stand in a more irregular um, manner. Uh, and this, this is something that may be more useful for late transformation. We can see pictures here from um, a site, which is a woodlot site, um, uh, just north of Mahuncliffe, where um, larch has been thinned. It's, it's an intimate mixture of Douglas fir and larch, so planted very close together, larch and, and Douglas fir intermingled. Uh, the, the lower picture is where all of the larch has been removed, so it's a really severe thin. Um, <laughs> almost like a selective fell really, and then it's been restocked in between. Um, just conscious of time, so I'm gonna move on to look at um, infrastructure very quickly. Uh, so we can see here, this, is, this picture on the right-hand side is taken from the ancient Woodland restoration module number four, and it moves from year zero through to year 20. Uh, we can see progressively um, these racks have been put into the site, um, and we can see the, the, the the darker blobs are broadleaf trees and the, the light blobs are, are conifer. Um, so as the conifer are thinned uh, using these um, systematic lines and racks which are, which are removed, we can see an increase in the diversity of the, of the stand and an increase in the, in the broadleaf species as we move through to year 20. Um, so it's important to establish a, a series of extraction racks which um, can sit in place for the forever really we, we don't want to be driving all over the all over the, the forest floor um, we can, uh, it, these have to be put in appropriately to, to work with the contours of the site and I've taken these two pictures from a really useful book um, called the farm tractor in the forest which was produced by the Swedish Board of Forestry and we have a picture here of, a, of an extraction rack so um, harvester would drive drive through on this rack every time a thin is carried out and the uh, the, the harvester would either be able to reach into the stand or, or trees would be felled by a chainsaw operator into the rack and then picked up by the harvester. Okay, so that's a um, whistle stop tour of thinning, of thinning regimes. Um, just looking quickly at uh, some of the different methods of, um, of uh, extraction uh, that, we, that might be appropriate for the restoration of planted, planted ancient woodland sites. So um, horse logging might, be, might, might work on, on sites or might be the only thing we can do, especially on triple SIs, um, uh, because it really reduces the compaction on the floor that other machinery might have. And, and the, the horse uh, extract, extraction routes are very narrow and thin. Um, and uh, after, say, a year, there's no, um, there's no impact uh, visible, whereas the, the ruts that are created from um, other larger machinery are often um, still in place for years to come. Other ways of reducing that impact on the forest floor are to use systems such as cable cranes or skylines where um, the, the timber is winched up um, and, and removed without having an impact on the, on the forest floor. Small scale um, forwarder trailers uh, operated by, this is a, a, a low impact uh, forwarder here, um, but we've also got examples of um, uh, tractor skidding, this is a counter tractor uh, with a winch which can skid out the timber. Um, and then in the bottom right hand corner, this is a harvester, which can, which it's a Ponzi scorpion, which can reach right into the stand um, and uh, extract a, um, a conifer growing in amongst broadleaves. And the, um, yeah, the accuracy of this, of these machines is amazing. So that's just um, a few examples of different systems that we could use uh, to carry out cause restoration. Um, and I'm going to come to an end almost, uh, but I just want to talk about um, ecological processes. So as a result of the first and second phases of work, we hope that we'd see um, growth in the crowns of the remnant trees that we're focusing our, our management on. And we might even see some epicormic growth, so side shoots, especially in oak, 
Um, and I don't, I mean, this, could, this, I don't think this is a big problem because actually any growth, any growth in um, the leaf uh, um, surface area that a tree has is going to have a, an important uh, corresponding factor to the root growth uh, below the ground. Um, and that's what we're really looking for. We're just really looking for some uh, uh, life to kind of pulse back into the tree, pulse back into the site. We're looking for seed production of these uh, broadleaf species on site. But also, as we open up uh, the stands, we're going to see um, regeneration. Uh, we're going to see seed being blown in from outside the site and being brought in um, by uh, jays and by squirrels from outside the site. Um, so we're hoping we, we can see a very visible um, increase in advanced regeneration of site native species. But we see these cones of regeneration building up in canopy gaps, and we can um, we can focus our management on those areas in order to um, uh, promote the growth of the regeneration and also to recruit uh, fast growing um, stems into the canopy to be the successive um, uh, broadleaf canopy after the removal of most of the conifer. But we're going to look at we're going to see a mixed crop. Um, occurring for many years on, on, on a number of these sites. Um, and we hope to see the gradual strengthening and spread of these floral hotspots. And here are some pictures where you can see um, this one at the top is a large canopy that's gradually been thinned and it's got a really healthy broadleaf understory, a mixture of hazel, oak, rowan and birch coming up underneath. Um, and that is the end. It's a really, really um, big topic to cover so quickly, but Diofan Baoyan, uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to take some questions now, um, but hopefully in the future we can all meet again in the woods as, as depicted in this picture here. Um, this is the link to the Woodland Trust restoration modules. So if you just search Woodland Trust, how we restore ancient woodland, you'll get um, five different modules covering the process I've um, rapidly sped through today. Um, and uh, yes, it's a partnership project led by uh, Snowdonia National Park and it's Celtic Rainforest Wales. Um, that's the website for Celtic Rainforests. And but this is my email address at the bottom if you want to contact me. Okay. Thank you very much, Adam. There's no food for thought there. So we'll see if we have any questions. I'll give you an opportunity now to think about your questions. I have had somebody asked in the chat if it would be possible for them to see this again. I know that a few have had a bit of difficulty um, joining us in time, something with a link. It will be available on YouTube next week on YouTube for the, that's relevant to the project. And you can see Adam at the screen that he actually shared. If you email me, if you want me to send you that link when it is available, you're very welcome to do that. Does anybody have any questions? You can put it in the chat, if you wish. We have one from Matt Shrimpson as follows. Um, Matt, Matt's question: What what is the what's my opinion on introducing wildlife ponds into pores? Um, that's yeah, it's a great um, it's a great question. Um, yeah, I, I think it's a it's a really really good idea, um, but I think it has to be uh, it has to be targeted in the right place. Um, so uh, yeah, I think it, the best way to do it is to probably look at your at the the water flow on site and where you've got areas where it's already quite boggy but we want to look at what species are there so i think i think um you know it's often in the kind of boggy wet areas you might have species that you don't have elsewhere so floral species um which you might want to safeguard um so i think that putting ponds in woodlands is a, is a great idea our wet woodland habitat our bog woodlands are really um severely lacking so, you know, that's something we want to increase, but I think it has to be done. I think, I think it'd be really important to get uh, the, the opinion of an ecologist um, and uh, before, you, before you do anything um, uh, in order to kind of plan your work appropriately. But uh, yeah, I'm all up for more, more ponds in woodlands, definitely. Thank you. We have one more question. 
like I said, you're wel welcome to put your question in the question and answer. Okay, yeah, thanks, Sabine. That's a really, it's a great question. Um, so if we go way back um, and we look at the pollen record, uh, then Scots pine were all over Wales um, in the, uh, the boreal period. They were some of the first trees to kind of um, to recolonise um, the, the, the British Isles and to, and to recolonise Wales after the, the, the retreat of the, of the ice sheets um, after the last ice age. Um, so, you know, I think that it depends how far you are, how far back you go. Um, I mean, for me, I don't, uh, I tend to um, look, look pretty favourably on Scots pine um, because compared to other conifers, well, it's one of our native conifers in the British Isles, one of our native conifers. So it's, it's important to, 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 to look after it, but it doesn't have a really dense crown and it doesn't have, uh, it, it doesn't cast a lot of shade like other, other conifer species do. Um, so often under Scots pine stands, we've got quite a, um, a we've got we've got quite an intact understory of um, of the uh, floral community that you'd expect to find in ancient woodland. So you know I think there's a place for Scots pine, um, especially when it comes to uh, you know red squirrels and pine martin. Um, and there's quite a lot of work going on into looking at um, you know if there's any remnant Scots pine um, still in Wales. So yeah, for me, I'm, I, I definitely would welcome it um, in a way to diversify the, the mixture. Um, you know, I think that we have to be um, we have to be pragmatic about how we manage these sites, um, and it often comes down to, for me, a mixture between what the owner's objectives are and what the site can support and what we feel the site should be supporting in terms of um, the different plant species. Uh, just, just Dylan, a minor hit him on a question. With Following on from that, we've since received the question as follows. Okay, the question from. Um, it's come in on the chat. Oh, from Brian. So I just mentioned Scots pine. I've seen old nets, and there's another one as well in there. But Where can we source Scots pine? Mm -hmm. Would, is, would that be from a supplier? Do you mean like in what yeah. specific tree nurseries? Yeah, I mean many of the supplies. many of the tree nurseries. Um, there's many of the tree nurseries along the border of Wales. There's there's a few different ones um, you can source Scots pine from. Um, but I think it would be good to if you can find some old old Scots pine. Um, you get some. You know, uh, apparently Scots pine was planted along drovers. The roots of um, you know drovers roots in the, in the past. So sometimes you see um, stands of Scots pine or single Scots pine. It might be really um, good to try and collect some of the seed from those and try and grow some. Um, there are there are a few. Uh, there's a project which uh, the Wooden Trust and Professor Goldwig are carrying out at the moment, which is uh, in order to increase community um, plant nurseries, community tree nurseries. And I think um, it'd be really good to try and gather some Scots pine from around Wales. Thank you, Ma Mana. Thank question. you very much. There is another question here. It's in two parts, Adam. As follows. Okay, in two parts. Okay, yeah. So, is small coop felling a sensible option on a Sitka spruce dominated site? Um, yeah, I think so. Def definitely. I, if it's a, if it depends on uh, the age of the stand of spruce uh, and its density. Um, I would I would try to um, establish some uh, wind firmness through doing some line thinning, maybe some graduated density thinning that I talked about before, where you take out one rack and then you work your way towards a rack in the middle that's, that you retain. And in between the retained rack and the removed rack, you have a, a graduated density of trees. So it's unthinned 40 year old. OK, yeah, I would um, I would. I would probably put some, I would probably do some line thinning <laughs> first. And then um, that, that, that would, uh, I think if you open up large, well, you said small coop felling, but if you start to open up small coops, you might, um, you might open up the stand to a bit of wind blow. So I would probably like thin across the stand in a systematic way and then wait and come back. Um, and then on the next thinning cycle, I might think about opening up um, some small coops, uh, but just let some wind firmness build first. Thank so you. 
So we have five minutes left now. I don't think we have any questions. If you do have a question, you're welcome to ask it quickly now before we leave. Where would you actually refer people for further information at them? Are there any particular sites that you'd encourage people to visit or anywhere else? Um, yeah, I think that um, I would go and have a look at the Celtic Rainforest Wales website. Um, I put the, um, the link up to that earlier on. Um, and I'd also look at the Woodland Trust uh, website. We've got a whole area focused on the restoration of ancient woodland. Um, and um, if you uh, want to have a look at where the ancient woodland is, you can look at um, SLE, which is the, the, well, the Wales Government and Spatial Data Portal. And it's actually pretty easy to use, even though that's not complicated. Um, but if you, if you look at um, SLE, so double L E, um, if you search SLE Spatial Data, uh, you'll get that website will pop up. And there's a map viewer for the ancient woodland inventory where you can. Um, you can look at a map of Wales and you can put the layer of uh, the ancient woodland inventory on the top. So you can find your local area and see where the, where the ancient woodland is. Um, and yeah, we are, you know, the Woodland Trust, I work for the outreach department. So my job is a woodland outreach advisor. And um, that, that's what I do. I help uh, private woodland owners and woodland owning organisations or community groups to bring their ancient woodlands into a process of positive management. Um, so, so trying to let the light into these very shaded uh, plant and ancient woodland sites. Thank you. There will be more opportunities with the training as well. And we're hoping later on this year we will be able to hold events on site and in the future of the project as well, hopefully. Of course, it will depend on the rest COVID restrictions. But if you want further information about those events, you're welcome to email me, anita.diamond at um, And it's also on the details that you've received to join the webinar. So keep in touch and we'll let you know when there's more training available. Was there anything else you wanted to say, Adam, before we leave? Um, no, but, um, oh yeah, I just wanted to say, I'm really enjoying it. It's a really exciting project. I'm really enjoying working uh, on the ground in Berioned and really enjoying uh, collaborating with um, all the staff at Snowdonia National Park. So uh, if you're a landowner and you're in Berioned uh, and you think you might have an ancient woodland, then get in touch with me or get in touch with um, Anita. And um, yeah, we can see whether we can do a survey of your site. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Adam. A great presentation and thanks to everybody who's joined us this afternoon. Hopefully we'll be able to meet again sometime. Thank you very much. Dios All the best. Dios.